Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm more than aware that there's uh, some quite illustrious security researchers in the room, so I feel quite nervous myself. Um, so um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, side hustle is one word for the GSMA work. Uh, it's kind of like another full-time job, as it feels like, but I don't get paid for it. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm in my final term as uh, FASG chair. And um, over the years that I've been involved in this, it's significantly grown. The whole domain has, has, has expanded massively. Um, I, I actually started my career in the semiconductor industry, uh, doing an apprenticeship in a, in a DRAM fab, uh, and ended up moving to a company called Panasonic Mobile, uh, writing uh, equipment and, and software for them, um, and ended up uh, setting up their product security function and investigating embedded systems hacking. Uh, that, that led to um, doing some work that evolved into what's now the trusted execution environment uh, for, for industry and working on a lot of, sort of hardware security and mobile device problems. Um, obviously, with my work with Copperhorse, we've, we've ended up doing a lot of work in uh, different domains, including uh, the mobile network domain. And uh, the work in, in uh, GSMA uh, has to cover everything. And, and that's really what I'm going to talk to you about now and hopefully give you a little bit of an insight into um, the huge amount of work that GSMA does and also the fact that of the thousands of people that are fraud and security group, um, they're all largely volunteers. So they're, yes, their companies are sending them to, to work on these problems, um, but the vast majority of people are, are doing a lot of this in their own time. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, we do have people who are sort of quasi-academics who are involved as well and you know, involved in industry and work with the companies as well. Uh, and we, we have uh, lots of different people from different backgrounds uh, across the world with different problems, uh, uh, as, as we'll see. Um, so um, the name of this talk uh, was really about Yanis. Uh, so uh, Yanis obviously uh, is uh, famous for uh, January and the transition between uh, um, the years. Um, Yanis is the, the god of uh, boundaries and beginnings. Uh, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages and ending. Uh, changes and transitions such as the progress of past to future from one condition to another, uh, from one vision to another, and of course uh, spatial transitions and mobile interconnect. Uh, which you'll all be extremely aware of. Um, so, um, but I do do think this is it, this is where my thinking is right now, and uh, based on some of the conversations at breakfast as well, I think it's where other people's thinking is as well. Which is, um, we are at one of those points of transition right now uh, in mobile telephony, which is where are we going next? Uh, there is a process underway um, through ITU and through the different standards bodies um, where we have the opportunity to decide what is, what is happening next. Um, but my, my primary job is to look backwards. The operational security issues that we primarily face within the industry are legacy issues. And I saw on some of the talks that, um, that we'll be talking about bidding down attacks, for example. There are a lot of uh, issues that involve facing backwards. And um, one of, one of the issues of, that, that we, we face is that um, when you implement mobile telephony, uh, it costs a lot of money. And the vast majority of countries in the world are not very rich countries. And so that leaves a lot of legacy behind. So the generational changes don't happen in one big leap. We don't leap to 5G as a global population. That, there are still countries, <coughs> UK, uh, that are running GSM. <laughs> Um, and we'll continue from GSM for smart meters for some time. So we have to defend that legacy for a very long time. But in other places, it's for economic reasons um, that you can't just rip and replace. Or every time we discover some major algorithmic issue, we can't just replace a network because that costs billions of dollars. So we kind of have to work within the par parameters that are, are set for us, not for the ones that, that we want. So we're kind of you know, playing, we're having to play the cards that we're dealt and not what the cards would, we would like them to be. Um, so um, 
this is a picture of the, the Temple of Janus, uh, which is in Rome, and they, they left the gates uh, um, open in times of war. They weren't closed very often in Roman era, um, but they, were, they would be closed to hold in discord and fury. Um, now, um, when it comes to mobile interconnect, uh, there's a lot of discord and fury. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of um, issues with interconnect, uh, which, which we'll, we'll come on and talk about. So um, to talk to you about what FASG is, so the Fraud and Security Group. So uh, we actually originated uh, as the security group, and we had a fraud forum. And then in mid-2010s, we merged the two groups, um, which is very interesting because you kind of got, like, the anti-fraud community, they're usually, like, the ex-customs and police officers and the investigators of the world. And then the security group are, are mainly the sort of academic folks. And never the twain shall meet. But we were forced together. And it's actually been a, a healthy uh, cooperation. Um, because especially as we're seeing this sort of merging, especially as we move to all IP networks, we're seeing a, a merging of um, these two spheres where a lot of frauds, they only exist because there's a, a security vulnerability over here somewhere. So both sides understanding each other's worlds is very, very uh, useful to us. Um, we meet, uh, we have a plenary three times a year. We've, we've got one coming up at the end of June, and we try to rotate that around the world. Um, as, a, as I mentioned, we have thousands of individuals from all the hundreds of network operators that are members of the GSMA, and then all the surrounding ecosystems, so all the vendor community, um, a lot of the security companies, uh, and a lot of the anti-fraud companies as well. Um, and each of those people bring a different perspective, and it cr has created this sort of center of expertise that we have. We have some of the world's leading minds on mobile security. Um, I guess where we differ to, say, 3GPP, is that, I guess, broadly the focus of the people within GSMA is on the operational end. So we do get involved in defining the requirements for future networks and um, for fixing issues with standards and so on, but our role is mainly on actually implementing the standards and actually uh, using that in operation and then dealing with the operational issues that, that occur after that. Um, we have a number of uh, different subgroups. Um, we have a number of work items that we produce uh, and I guess that we're sort of the engine of the GSMA in that respect in that we'll pick a particular topic that has not been addressed so key management for inter PLM security for example uh, or operational issues like how do we um, look at the security of network equipment and come up with a unified scheme that works across the world in terms of NISAS um, and we developed those together, and pretty much it's kind of like a standards body in, in some respects, and very close to standards in some of the stuff that we produce, in that it's consensus driven. Um, so that can lead to, I guess, some unhealthy compromises uh, in some cases, but broadly uh, we tend to come to sensible conclusions, I would say, um, and we try to stay ahead of, uh, say, uh, you know, where there's a problem that's emerging, we try to get ahead, or say the regulators would. If it, if it gets to a regulator, then there's a real problem. The industry has not dealt with that problem properly, and there's been essentially a market failure. Um, so, but the, I think the general problem is as this space expands massively, there are so many challenges that we face, and there are only so many people to deal with those issues and to consider them in detail. Uh, that we end up with a sort of capacity issue. And then on top of that, you end up with a lot of security regulation anyway. So uh, try, trying to manage that is, uh, is pretty tough. Um, but um, the way that we work is that, you know, four companies have to come up with uh, the requirement for uh, starting a piece of work. And then obviously we have to have continued uh, support for that work. Um, and that's really what governs uh, what, what starts and what doesn't start. Um, obviously, the industry reputation is an issue. Um, it's 
it's a useful tool for me, actually, to be honest, to, to help to drive forward things that we need to do. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, mostly those people, is, security is one of those areas that it drives passionate people. People believe in it. They want to help the consumers. They want to help protect people. And so it's not particularly difficult to get people on board um, uh, in the group to, to help to push things through. Um, but, of course, there is a lot of media attention on security issues these days, and, and sometimes maybe unfairly. Um, it can be frustrating when you've worked on something for years and the kind of press gets at the wrong end of the stick and implies that there's nothing being done. Um, and sometimes you can't say anything about that at the time. Um, also, I think if I go back to uh, some of the issues I've worked on before, for example, with IMEI security, so device identity protection. Uh, when I was working at Panasonic, um, we would spend a huge amount of time investigating what hacking was going on, disrupting those hacking groups and so on. But at the end of the day, if one of those hacks got through and started to be sold, then the argument is, of course, that um, the security is broken. You know, uh, it doesn't. You know, people don't see the months and months of research that's gone on in the criminal community to get to that point. Years in some cases, uh, and it's an extremely difficult job. But you know, you have to accept that at the end of the day, if a shop is selling a tool for removing SIM locks or for reprogramming the IMEI. That is the actual outcome. It is a security failure. And nothing, nothing that you did in that process to disrupt that or to delay it changes the fact that there's the, the point of security failure is that this tool is available in the shops. And it costs £10 for somebody to change an IMEI number. Um, so it's very difficult. And, and certainly, um, I think I've try to educate, for example, the police on IMEI security uh, and mobile theft about that whole pyramid of criminality that exists going up to, towards the guys who are really doing the, the smart work on the embedded uh, systems hacking side. I've also pointed out to them that if you take out the top of that pyramid, then the, the rest of that criminal tree doesn't exist. And there's a real future question. Uh, how we can tackle uh, uh, the you know, criminal tools, um, some of which creates uh, very great harm. Um, and I guess it kind of links to um, the grey market for zero days and so on. Um, and also things like spyware. So this is something that uh, is a big challenge for us right now and I'm going to cover uh, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so we have, the, the way that the group works is um, we have four main uh, subgroups, actually another one where we're just electing the chair at the moment, uh, which is an intelligence group. So actually about 50% of what we do is sharing uh, security intelligence and fraud intelligence, and um, we're just reconstituting that group now. Um, we have some regional interest groups. And I think one important thing to say about fraud, for example, is that it's often very localized. It's localized in the MOs um, that are used. Um, so, for example, uh, the issue of virtual kidnapping. Um, uh, so does everyone know what virtual kidnapping is? No? OK, so virtual kidnapping is where um, it's often actually originating in prisons. So somebody makes a call um, to just a random number and then pretends that they've kidnapped uh, that person's child, and then they have another prisoner or themselves in the background doing muffled screaming. And it's really, really interesting because it's a very, very simple scam to uh, implement, but it kind of uh, tricks people psychologically very quickly, and people fall for it. And because they're tied up on the phone, um, they also um, uh, aren't usually able to go and validate they can't make another call to check that their daughter is well. Uh, and of course, um, it doesn't matter if they hit a few uh, uh, people that don't have kids or whatever. Um, they just need to get the one in 100. And then the scam takes place from there. So then there's money transferred and so on. 
Um, but it's actually quite a localized thing. It's localized uh, particularly to Latin America. It's spread into the United States, but it's not something really that we see uh, on a broad basis in Europe. Uh, and, and the same applies to, to other things. Some of it's technology-based. Um, so obviously mobile money for the unbanked, um, so uh, tools like m uh, are often used in sub-Saharan Africa and places like Afghanistan. Um, and they're not used in, in uh, Western countries like the UK or Germany or US. And so there are particular frauds that emerge in particular regions, and that's that those regional focus groups are really useful in terms of um, uh, helping to understand triage and, and share that intelligence and, and the actions on, and how to deal with those issues. Um, I'm going to touch on each one of these areas. Um, and um, yeah, just to, just to say that all of those chairs uh, work extremely hard uh, um, and mostly in their free time. So our, our work items are focused uh, by, I guess, technical domain. Um, and um, th there are different ways you can group these things. I, I did think about reordering the groups into to some other domain, but we end up in this, uh, we usually end up in this uh, kind of grouping. So security insurance covers both network equipment, it also covers uh, SIM assurance as well, and now eSIM assurance. That's what the working group's responsible for. And then what we've also done is set up certain operational things where we ask the GSMA, please can you provide staff to manage this particular service? Um, so one of those is CVD. Um, so um, I know uh, some of you are very well aware of the GSMA CVD scheme. Um, I'll come back to this. Um, but that is an operational service that we, we ask the GSMA to run. And uh, Roger, who's at the back there, um, is, the, is the guy that's, that's, that's running that. And, and that is, uh, we have the CVD committee, which is also staffed by the members and the experts and the members. Um, we also have this uh, T-ISAC, um, which is the telecoms ISAC, um, which is a way of um, sharing, I guess, automated intelligence and indicators of compromise and trying to, I guess, revolutionize the way that intelligence is shared. Um, because Traditionally, intelligence would be shared bilaterally between people that, you know, the head of security of this company to the head of security of that company or the head of fraud or at our regular meetings face to face. Um, but there's really a latency issue there. And, and the same with some of the intelligence we used to share about, for example, uh, bad numbers. It won't surprise you that, you know, those numbers were shared around in Excel sheets and someone would sit on them for weeks. And then the, the class is hot numbers, which I found a bit ironic because they were pretty much stone cold in some cases by the time they actually got to the people who needed them. And I think this is not just our industry. This is, uh, this is inherent in any industry that is uh, quite old, I guess, uh, that they need to revolutionize that because the attackers are using machine assistance things change rapidly, particularly things like MSI, SDNs, phone numbers. There's, in a lot of cases, there's no real person behind that number. Um, the number itself, there's no integrity protection so, or authenticity, so you, you can't know that it's actually a real number anyway. So we have to question you know, what we are sharing as intelligence. Is that actually useful intelligence, or is it the kind of you know, shit in, shit out problem, basically. That, you know, this beta is essentially useless because uh, the result of using that intelligence might end up where innocent users are cut off, for example, because it just happens that frauds to just pick that number. We see the same problem with the IMEI database, actually. So we have an IMEI database, which is used for, for lost and stolen handsets, stolen handsets, um, and that is designed as a global database. But there was a reluctance by some countries and some members to, to use that data. And that actually, the core of that goes back down to, again, what is an IMEI number? An IMEI number, yes, it's defined, but if I create a counterfeit device, a Shanzai device, I can just pick any number I want and put that in there. 
and probably it's not going to change anything. Um, and this is a big problem, uh, particularly in developing countries where um, there a lot of tax avoidance, a lot of sort of grey market shipments of goods, lots of phones in boxes with TVs in and other sorts of equipments, uh, bypassing customs, and, and, they, and they have tax on importation, so it's a way of getting around that. Um, so they have no way to block this stuff. Uh, but where's the Shanzai device and the IMEI number is actually just the same every time, you know, you've got 20,000 handsets with the same IMEI number because nobody was really checking it, then it's a real problem. Um, so, um, so one of our future challenges, maybe, is what do we do about future identifiers? How do we actually create genuine, authentic identifiers that other people can, can validate? Uh, and it's not as trivial uh, as it sounds. And there have been various attempts in FreeGPP to, to try to address it. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that we'll try again in the future. Um, but you see the same problem crop up time and time again, uh, where identity and validating identities uh, is a problem. Um, so CLI spoofing, for example, um, it's too easy for me to be able to change a phone number. And, and, and it doesn't matter if we fix some of the protocols, that, that, that kind of uh, helps, but it still doesn't address the core identity issue. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned that obviously the, the, the threat landscape now is ginormous. If you think about a mobile phone, uh, if we go back to, I don't know, the late 90s, um, the only things that we were really bothered were uh, abuse of uh, subscription, uh, so people stealing uh, you know, call, calls or making premium rate calls, uh, maybe some messaging issues of SMS. Um, the phone books were stored on the SIM maybe 10 numbers, maybe a bit more. Um, it looks like actually quite a golden era <laughs> for like, it, you know, we thought the security problems then were hard. Um, and yeah, they were hard because we didn't necessarily have the technology to fix stuff. Like, for example, on my side, trying to protect data on a mobile handset, we didn't have any hardware security. There was no way we could implement stuff. That's actually why the SIM card exists, actually is because there was no really trustable way of doing secure hardware uh, that, that was also going to meet the processing and execution requirements. That's how we originated. That's how we originated with the SIM in the 1980s. The same for air interface security. We're limited by the technical capabilities. So it's all well and good for people to laugh and go, oh, 56-bit keys, what were they thinking? Well, they were thinking that was state of the art at the time, to be honest with you. They were also thinking in an environment where um, the telcos were essentially just becoming privatized. They, the, the prevailing thing at the time was essentially that nation states would run the telco and all the baggage that went with that. Export controls and so on. Um, it, the history is very, very different. The other kind of history that we also have is um, actually going back to the days of the telegraph. And actually, even go back further, right? So we can I, I, I sometimes talk about uh, you know historical, very historical things. So you know, do you think Caesar would be concerned that we're still using a Caesar shift cipher in some applications in 2023? Do you think he would be surprised? Um, I think so. Um, what we see with application developers in a lot of cases in the, in the IoT world is uh, people not really understanding what security is about and jumping to, I guess, logical conclusions that if they obfuscate, then that's going to save them. And of course it isn't. We know it's not going to. So we repeatedly invent technologies and we repeatedly have a generation, another generation of people that don't understand those technologies, that don't understand the security needs of those technologies, whilst our adversaries are kind of growing in knowledge. So where the mobile industries had this kind of arms race against the hacking community, so if we take the mobile device side, we go from the car radio hacking community to the SIM unlocking community, 
to the, the jailbreaking routing community. That's the natural transition of most of those people. Going against handset vendors, going against the OS vendors, grouping together into, into uh, uh, sort of working groups as, as things got harder. They pulled their knowledge and expertise about certain chipsets and so on. And then IoT comes along and you've got a washing machine vendor. And they go, we're going to have our Kodak moment. We're going to die as a washing machine vendor unless we connect it to the internet. And they buy in the module. They know nothing about. They've got, maybe got an electronics engineer, integrates it. And then lo and behold, the thing is totally open. Um, there's been no security by design in that product. Uh, Telnet's open. It's got default password, admin, admin. Uh, and it's rich pickings. It's rich pickings not just for these guys here who are finding it quite difficult to get into mobile devices now, but it's also rich picking for all the automated tools that were created many years before to target Telnet or whatever protocol it is. So this is the problem that we're trying to deal with now. Um, this is before we've even touched the, the real network issues. And actually, the same issues apply. So default passwords in mobile network equipment, particularly around the GSM era and so on, but exist. They're still deployed in mobile equipment in networks today. And there just aren't enough people to deal with it. There aren't enough skilled people to deal with it. And what, we've ha what, what we're getting to now is a state where we have Government's recognizing that we need to regulate. There's, there is market failure. You know, everything's going towards CNI. All the telecoms networks, every, all of our lives are dependent on the mobile network. So, therefore, there has to be a commensurate change within the level of security of the mobile network. But there aren't enough people. And so governments are finding it difficult to recruit those people because everybody's fishing in the same pool for the same small pool of individuals. So we need to try and solve that problem. We need to try to, to skill up uh, on a big scale. Um, I won't say that the SS7 experts are dying, but um, they're a, a, <laughs> there's less and less of them. <laughs> um, and we need to solve that problem because SS7 is still deployed widely across the world. Um, I was going to talk to you about the blue box, but you can Google that. Um, so we've got a big landscape. We've got all these new, fantastic new technologies coming along, but we're looking back the other way, and we're, we're just accumulating legacy. Every day, we're accumulating technical and security debt. And this is, I guess, <laughs> very well illustrated by the signaling system. So. Um, Again, if we go back to the days of the telegraph, and then we and then we sort of fast forward a little bit. So we got rid of in-band in-band signaling. So that's your blue box uh, question, um, and 2600 tone, hertz tone and so on. And we moved to out-of-band signaling with SS7. ITU recommendation that that really originates in the 1970s and then implemented in the 1980s in GSM and then deployed essentially in the 1990s. It's still in networks now. Reason for that is because partly as a victim of the success of GSM-based telephony, we've managed to create a situation where we can go backwards. A 5G phone can connect to a 2G network and vice versa, and you can communicate, which is quite nice, but not if you're a security person. Because, and I see there's a talk on bidding down attacks, be, because it opens us up to that possibility of bidding down. So as an attacker, if I want to attack the air interface um, and I want to push a device onto 2G, uh, there are a number of different ways I can do it. I might want to say jam the LTE frequencies, and push that device towards 2G. I might want to change the, uh, the transmit power. And, and why am I trying to push that device onto 2G? Does anyone know? Sorry, it's a bit too early in it. 
lack of mutual authentication, right? So that's the main reason. So the problem that we've got as we we fix bugs in in equipment, but to fix bugs in standards often means a generational shift. We need to wait for that next big shift. So 3G introduced mutual authentication. So for a full space station, or Stingray as some, some people would have called them, uh, but for a false base station attack, um, if, to push it down to 2G, um, then you can start to look at stealing keys. And, and this is an issue. Um, it's also becoming an issue with SMS as well. So the problem is that people have started to apply new use cases to old technologies as well, which changes the value of that technology. So is not classed as a secure channel, right? Uh, it's not a secure messaging channel. But it is being used in a case where there's a requirement for a secure channel, in the case of 2FA messages. And the reason that SMS is used for 2FA is it's actually quite universal. It's on every single handset. It's almost guaranteed to get through, even though actually the specs have no requirement on uh, <laughs> delivery. Uh, but it's, it's actually universally used, and that's why it's useful as a channel for 2FA. And there was a big debate, which I won't go into, about whether it's better to have 2FA or not. Um, because if you only have a password, then the password's vulnerable to credential stuffing and so on. And actually having any kind of 2FA might be better than having the password. But that means then that we need to pay more attention to SMS. And certainly, because are paying more attention to SMS. And they're trying everything they can, either through malware or through some certain signaling system. Um, they're also using uh, SMS for phishing campaigns, smishing campaigns now. And we're seeing uh, malware like Flubot, for example, which is, I guess, a lot of the attacks that we see now just combine a lot of these different vulnerabilities together, different structural vulnerabilities. So in the case of Flubot, it abuses the accessibility mechanism on an Android device, which a lot of us have been concerned about for a long time. It's a very difficult problem to solve, which is you want people to be able to access the device, you need to be able to provide them with extra things, but those services can be abused. And I did see something the other day, actually, that, um, that kind of provides a neater way out of that problem, actually, which is uh, notifications about when accessibility services are being used on the device. Um, but whether that communicates it well, well enough to the user, I don't know. Um, but in the case of Flubot, it was therefore able to abuse the SMS function and then spread, spread its merry way with its uh, smishing messages. Combined also with, um, I was going to use AI. I won't use AI. Auto-generated domains. So very high frequency rapid generation domains. Very difficult to shoot down. And I think the scale of what is available to an attacker now in terms of the sort of general toolkit is absolutely incredible. And so when you push that towards the legacy stuff,
have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, I saw Guevara first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is about uh, the air interface. Uh, you initially you talked about the bidding down, and uh, you know, adversary could uh, uh, jam, for example, LTE and so on. Um, and then later in the talk, you talk about self-organizing networks. Uh, so my question is. Uh, in uh, academia, people have been designing lots of very sophisticated attacks, very low power, you know, targeting specific signaling and so on. Uh, so how much do you see of uh, any attacks on the air interface? And then uh, are they sophisticated or they're fairly simple, like jamming LTE? Um, well, in a lot of cases, those kind of things that happen beyond the base station aren't seen as being sophisticated. And so you end up with anecdotes. You know, for example, uh, the, I guess the, the, the most recent one was the uh, full space station in the back of the taxi in Paris that, the, that, that they blew up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we do also see where it's being commoditized for uh, fraud. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, we call SMS blasters using full space stations. The aim there is to push out phishing messages or uh, illegal content in that particular country. Um, we also see um, the use of SIM boxes for fraud as well. Um, so, but typically the radio path stuff, um, it's very difficult to detect. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the talk. Very nice. Any other questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned briefly about uh, post-quantum and you have that you have been looking into that. So uh, I was curious about about that. So whether you are looking at uh, or whether or not you have a specific preferences or which post-quantum algorithms are going to work better uh, uh, for cellular systems, whether or not you are actually uh, trust the NIST standardized algorithms or you're looking at certain types of algorithms, whether or not you're looking at the certificate parts, you know, the challenges of the post-quantum certificate. So I was curious to learn about what you are doing in that direction. Thank you. So there's a couple of activities that happen in GSMA. So we have the post-quantum telecoms uh, task force, essentially, which is being led by Ashish Kumar, who's from the Indian Institute of Technology. And uh, they produce a couple of white papers on this. Base, but they recognize obviously that Etsy have done a lot of work uh, under Matt Campagna from AWS that, that is absolutely fantastic in terms of, uh, you know, the first step is actually understanding your own network and where you're vulnerable, whether it's the uh, uh, SIMs or whether it's particular uh, equipment you've got and where stuff will have to be replaced or where the, um, essentially, there's some crypto agility for you to be able to move up to uh, support um, those out of libraries, because that's the reality. Now, obviously, the concern you mentioned about, for example, the NIST algorithms, there was obviously that incident where one of the candidate algorithms was broken. And I think that's a wake-up call, which is we could wheel all this stuff out and it could suddenly be broken. That has happened before. So it's just ensuring the practical elements of this at the moment, which is, is it available to us? Is it available in that suite of algorithms that we can choose? And that's, in some spaces it's easier, like for example, cloud services, it makes our lives a lot easier, in other places it's a lot more difficult. Um, for example, protocols where we have to change key lengths. Some protocols you just cannot change. So th those are the challenges that we really face, I think. And it's really at the identification stage. We don't know what the timeline is. There are some people, that will say the timeline is 10 years, there are other people say, oh, we've only got three years. And the truth is no one knows, actually. But it's not a Y2K issue, you know, we just don't know, and I think we're just trying to prepare on a steady timeline without a sort of alarmism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned in the talk the importance of maintaining backward compatibility, but there's all sorts of security problems because a lot of fixes are only made in major generational shifts. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there any work into allowing downgrades when they're required whilst making it harder to force them as an attacker? Yes, so I did talk about this in breakfast, actually. Um, so, this is purely a personal. I think our next step, I think 
think we've already sort of crossed the Rubicon when it comes to um, the lifetime of supporting that. My personal view is our next large technological step, we should be looking for it. But, to your point, that could allow for backwards compatibility with some containerization at very close monitoring. So you could potentially provide interfaces. We have the technologies, right? Virtualization, right? We, we could do it, but it needs a kind of step change in thinking to say we don't necessarily need to support all this stuff. In some cases, you can't anyway. Australia's turned off 2G. A lot of countries have turned off 2G to be a spectrum. But I, I do think that is exactly what we need to be doing, is, is being extremely carefully about what we do. Can I ask a very brief follow-up question? Um, is it possible to have end-user devices and some kind of security mode where they'll selectively only target a specific generation of telecommunications technology? Or is this baked into the standard somehow? We will talk about that during the panel as well. Great. There's going to be multiple perspectives on that. Cool. Thank you. Because I heard many things in the morning which was so surprising. I just want you to repeat what you said in the morning. <laughs> so uh, can you confirm what's the meaning of getting the CVD number? Getting the CVD number. CVD number. All right, okay. So I'll back to you on that. And it seems, so, so the, the further question, so, it seems that academia is using it as like indoor, uh, endorsement from the actual GSMA about the vulnerability. I've never heard that before. But I think what it is, maybe, maybe it's a, a naming uh, sort of homophone issue, right? Which is CVD, 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 number. So people are thinking that issuing a CVD number, which is just an ID for the submission, is the same as issuing a CVE. And, and it's not the case. Is that right, Roger? Yeah. So I, I think what we'll do, we'll discuss that internally because it might just be a name uh, thing that we need to do. But we, that number is just to allocate the CPD, not, not any endorsement of anything. It's just that's the submission. Okay, it's official from the GSMA chair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and also about the uh, clean slate design. Uh, so this is, that is your personal opinion, it's not some widespread opinion from the uh, GSMA. Yeah, it's not, the, the GSMA doesn't have a view on it, I don't think at the moment. Um, you know, as I say, we, you know, day to day we're dealing with all the current issues and dealing with, you know, 5G standalone, never mind the next, next uh, thing. And a lot of those issues, a lot of those discussions are happening uh, in the governments and happening in academia and also happening in um, Fiji. But as I say, that's, that's purely a personal opinion based on my experience and based on what I see on the ground. I think it would be a sensible move to, to make a step change. Was there any discussion about clean slate design of the security mechanism for cellular? The security side for? Cellular infrastructure. So cellular security, yeah, clean slate. Was there any discussion about what if we do um, like... Only everything is privately, not, not there's not a, a particular working group that is thinking about that um, within GSMA at the moment. Okay. As I say, we, we are still deep in the thick of 5G stuff. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, thank you for the talk. It was fantastic and enlightening. So I was wondering whether in group to train like uh, lesser expert uh, network operators to kind of not use this default passwords because this seems like a problem keeps repeating. So what 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 yeah, active? Uh, I mean, this is a general educational problem for the world, right? Um, but I do think that we have a time to play in that. And one thing that I would like to see, and I have been pushing for years, is that the security standards should be more 
in my final term as chair, um, I would like to see perhaps the GSMA uh, have some formalised training to say, for example, S7 security, we have all the expertise, we have the member companies who can provide that, but uh, maybe even issue certificates. Um, but one of the other challenges is that the smaller operators, the, the abstraction away from operations to actual technical side is, is meant that there's been a brain drain. So some people deploy networks with not under, no understanding, and they're reliant on the vendors to maintain their security. And I think that that is a challenge that we have, is that um, it's not just our industry, but there are others too. I think that, that abstraction away, and they just don't know how it works. That's where the criminals and the attackers get away with it. I mean, so it, it's a lot like FIFA. When you kind of have grassroots uh, kind of uh, reach, then you can have more impact. Yeah. Uh, you, you get more visibility. Yeah, 100%. And we've seen that as well, actually, from COVID, where we persisted with our uh, virtual meetings and things like that. And we didn't have any visibility into the country. Uh, so, so I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Actually, okay. because it's something that I really, really think we could, we could help with, and it could help to solve a lot of security issues. Education has a lot of security. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, we are uh, just about finished with this session.